Thank you, Evan, for that gracious introduction. Um, I want to begin uh, my lecture tonight by, uh, by mentioning that this past summer, I got an email from a scholar in Australia who was asking me about my work on religion and domestic violence, and she was kind of basically uh, motivated by a story that was running in the press down there about Christianity and domestic violence. And I hadn't heard, of course, anything about this. This is halfway across the world. And so, of course, I got on Google, and this is what I came across on um, the ABC site, which is one of their leading uh, news stations down there in, in Australia. This is the Australian Broadcasting Corporation, sort of their BBC in Australia. And this was quite a story, as you can imagine, from the title. This was the headline right up here on that story on ABC, ABC News. Um, it was a story really filled with harrowing tales of abuse of Christian women by Christian husbands, of infuriating failures of pastoral care and church discipline on the part of Christian clergy and counselors, and also of clueless comments from evangelical leaders um, about issues related to uh, domestic violence. What's more, the article dwelled extensively on the alleged links between Christian doctrines regarding male headship in the home and in the church um, and this problem of domestic violence. So kind of a quick read of this ABC story would give one the impression, um, in the words of the sort of subheadline in the story, that, quote, the church is not just failing to sufficiently address domestic violence, it's both enabling and concealing it. Okay, so this is kind of the, the takeaway from this big ABC story, both on the internet and then also um, on the television. This next slide um, is indicative here. Now, should I put this on up here? Or do you? Okay. So this gives you a, a sense of how they were kind of rolling out the story um, on television down there in, in Australia. ABC News investigation has put the focus on domestic violence and Christianity with claims the church is not just failing to sufficiently address domestic violence, it's both enabling and concealing it. Julie Baird is behind the investigation and joins us in the studio now along with Anglican priest Michael Jensen. Welcome both. Julie, can I start with you? Why did uh, you think it was important to look at domestic violence through this lens of Christianity? It was a conversation I had with a priest, a bishop from Queensland, who said to me, we were all talking about domestic violence in this country and the cultural factors contributing to it. Why don't we ever look at religion? And in fact, the Victorian Commission into Domestic Violence at Queensland Task Force had both identified religion and faith leaders and faith communities as having serious problems and being seriously resistant to change. So I started digging into it and found countless stories. I've spoken to dozens and dozens of women um, who within the church have experienced abuse at the hands of their husbands, who have twisted scripture to enable or to justify their abuse, who have then turned to their pastors and told them what's happened. They've not been believed, they've been turned away, they've been told to submit and to endure. Um, and because of that, they've ended up leaving the church and the perpetrator, um, which in some of the cases I've spoken to, has actually been in church leadership as a priest. Um, stays within the church and the woman leaves. So Michael, what's your response to that charge? The church enables and indeed conceals domestic well, I violence. Think, uh, so this gives you kind of, I think, a flavor of the kind of coverage that ABC uh, News was, was giving uh, to Christianity. Um, and also, as you kind of looked at the story, there was a clear suggestion that a traditional gender ideology or traditional gender perspective was helping to fuel uh, domestic violence uh, down under. So this whole kind of you know um, experience of kind of looking at what they were doing down there in Australia on this issue got me thinking. Um, and the more that I thought about this article um, and this sort of rollout down down there in Australia. Um, which, w of course, was painting a pretty damning portrait of religion's role, the more I became convinced that it was a harbinger, a harbinger of what I call the kind of coming conventional wisdom about religion. To what I think we can expect to hear more and more the following message from Hollywood, uh, from the academy, and from the media. And that message is that religion is not only a force for intolerance, but also a force for ill when it comes to the welfare of women, children and families. 
and that religious traditions such as evangelical Protestantism that advance traditional gender ideas or ideals are especially harmful on you know, these fronts as they relate to the welfare, again, of women, children, um, and families. And indeed, there are signs in the US that this kind of thinking, this kind of conventional wisdom is coming to America. Uh, last year, for instance, the University of Chicago psychologist, Jean DeSetti, claimed that religious children are less altruistic than children from more secular families. He went so far as to contend that his results reveal, quote, how religion negatively influences children's altruism. They challenge the view that religiosity facilitates pro-social behavior and suggest the secularization of moral discourse does not reduce human kindness. In fact, it does just the opposite. Now, his conclusions here in this study were based upon a study of sticker sharing and cartoon watching, I kid you not, among children aged 5 to 12 in a couple of cities around the globe. And these were not representative samples in these different cities. So there was a, I mean, a lot of people have kind of pointed to sort of methodological problems with his research, again, on stickers and, and, and videos um, as a way of determining whether or not children are altruistic. But in response to his study, in response to his findings, um, we saw headlines in the media uh, like the ones up here, you know, religious kids are jerks, um, or are religious children more selfish? So again, I think these kinds of studies, these kinds of messages are gonna become more and more common, um, not only in Australia, and obviously here, but um, just more generally. And well, you know, wh why is that? What, what's, what's sort of going on here? Well, I think what's happening here is that religion's ties to traditional morality, to traditional gender ideas, and yes, to politicians like Donald Trump, have made it subject to this kind of new skepticism. Um, and indeed, in some cases, outright hostility from the academy and from the media and from the pop culture. In other words, issues like abortion and gay rights and religion and politics have made the custodians of our culture more inclined to look at faith with a gimlet eye. So be prepared for more studies showing how Christianity is bad for women, uh, for children, um, and for families, like the one in Australia and, and like one we just heard about here uh, in the United States. So these kinds of stories, these kinds of claims, you know, give us food for thought. And I think we need to think about two questions in particular here. The first is, this, is religion generally a force for ill in American marriages, parent-child relationships, and families? And then secondly, is faith-fueled gender traditionalism a force for authoritarian and abusive family relations? And of course, this second question is particularly um, interesting to think about um, and, and at this institution in some ways in particular. So for instance, reacting to an earlier Southern Baptist Convention uh, statement on gender roles, the journalists Steve Roberts and Cokie Roberts claim that conservative Christian gender ideology, quote, can clearly lead to abuse, both physical and emotional. Or one of the top family psychologists in the country, John Gottman at the University of Washington, kind of weighing in on these kinds of, of themes, um, said this. He said, quote, as the religious right gains strength in the United States, there is also a movement of some fathers toward authoritarian parenting and child-rearing patterns of discipline. So again, is religion, particularly kind of more traditional expressions of religion, a force for authoritarian and abusive family relationships? So you know, what's the evidence here? And as we kind of think about the evidence, I want to just begin here with a, with a story about uh, Roberto and Marcia Flores as a way of kind of getting our, our heads wrapped around this sort of the nexus between religion and family life here in the United States. So consider Roberto, 37, and Marcia Flores, 35, who immigrated to the United States from Mexico when they were children. This couple are representative of some of the unique challenges and opportunities facing Latino couples here in the United States. These San Diego residents met in their early 20s, lived together for a number of years, and had their uh, daughter prior to getting married. In 1997, they wed and had a son shortly thereafter. For most of the early years of their relationship, Roberto struggled with drugs and alcohol and spent many weekends focused on soccer and friends rather than on his family. 
Quote, before I used to be in the world, Del Mundo, he says, I used a lot of drugs, I drank a lot. I didn't care for my family, not my wife, my brothers, mother and father. I didn't care about them. And he adds, when the weekend came, I left my wife, and I would go play soccer with friends, and then go drinking, and that was my whole weekend. If he had kept up this approach to family life, an approach characterized by intoxication and machismo oftentimes, Roberto thinks his family would have fallen apart. Quote, I'm sure my wife would have left me. Would have had my wife or kids anymore if I'd stayed in that path, unquote. But in 2000, Roberto took a detour. Some friends suggested that he and Marcia attend a retreat for couples at a local church. And after some prodding from her, he decided to go. Much to his surprise, Roberto was overcome, overcome at the retreat, filled with remorse over his failings as a husband and father. What happened next was powerful. That's when I met God, he said, adding, I cried before God, which is something that I had never done. I never cry. But a lot of things I never did before, I did on that day. Besides crying at the retreat, Roberto felt, quote, all the presence of God, unquote, and decided to stop using drugs, alcohol, and treating his family so poorly. In the wake of this retreat, then, Roberto and Marcia have seen a marked improvement in the quality of their marriage. Quote, when I started going to church, and they taught me that family is important and you have to care for it, he said, I never knew that before. I really didn't think I had to put my family first before. At church, he has learned that God has a plan for marriage. He must live unity in all aspects of his marriage. In practice, this has meant temperance and coming to embrace the notion that you need a lot of love to raise a good family. This is translated into big changes in their marriage and family life, changes for the better. And his experience is suggestive of how a shared faith can help a couple dealing with male misbehavior or other challenges. Their Catholic faith enabled Roberto to experience powerful, life-changing religious rituals and to become integrated into a religious community that embraces a positive, family-oriented ethos. Their faith, particularly Roberto's, has given the couple a sense of hope in helping to make the changes needed to strengthen their marriage and family life. Their experience, while dramatic, is by no means an outlier, even in 21st century America, as we shall see. Their experience is also suggestive of how a shared faith can help a couple dealing with male misbehavior or other challenges. Their Catholic faith enabled Roberto to experience, sorry, I missed. Sorry, moreover, as suggested in Elizabeth Briscoe's The Reformation of Machismo, in their case, as with other men, what we've seen is that religious faith can counter some of the misogynistic attitudes associated with machismo in the Latino community. In this case, Roberto has jettisoned his expectation that he could devote all of his free time to friends, soccer, and drinking, and leave Marcia with full responsibility for the caretaking and housework that are part and parcel of family life. Although their particular story of faith and family life is emblematic of many of the challenges and opportunities facing Latino couples, my research suggests that the benefits of shared church attendance extend to couples across racial and, eth and ethnic lines. Specifically, my work with Nicholas Wolf Wolfinger in our book Soulmates, Religion, Sex, Love, and Marriage Among African Americans and Latinos, indicates that couples are substantially more likely to report being happy in their relationship when both partners attend church compared to couples where neither partner does. My research also indicates that contrary to the suspicions of many in the media and the academy, Christianity generally doesn't turn men into authoritarian and abusive patriarchs, but rather to men with a new heart to serve their wife and children. So again, his experience in a very powerful way shows that Christianity can be a force directing men in a more constructive direction uh, for their families. So let me kind of expand now to sort of look at some of the empirical evidence, some of the data here when it comes to religion and family life uh, in America. So when we look at uh, attendance and relationship quality, uh, what we see here in our book, um, Soulmates, is that uh, couples, be they white, uh, black, or Latino who attend church together uh, are about 10 percentage points more likely to say that they're very happy um, in their relationships. And you know, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty striking finding for this kind of outcome um, in our book. And we also find here, uh, too, is that when you look at just sort of you know, his or her attendance, his attendance tends to be a bit more you know, important when it's just one partner. Who is, uh, who is attending church. Now, I also want to be careful here, though, just kind of as a side note, to uh, acknowledge 
that if you think about what this figure is showing you, it's also showing you that about one in five spouses um, who are attending together um, are not happy in their marriage. I want to be careful here not to sort of suggest to you today or tonight that uh, faith is some kind of like magic pill. And if you take it, you know, if you start going to church together as a couple, that all of your problems are going to be, <laughs> you know, uh, dealt with, um, that you're going to be living a life of wedded bliss every single year or, or hour of your marriage. Clearly that's not the case. Uh, we all know that, you know, that people have dry spells in their marriage, they have difficulties in their marriage, um, and attending church, you know, can be helpful, but isn't necessarily um, a kind of magic pill for, for those kinds of tools. But again, compared to less religious Americans, they're more likely um, to be flourishing on this outcome. And then when, we, when I've looked, actually, in a different book, at uh, my book's uh, Soft Patriarchs, New Men, um, I looked at evangelical Protestant men, mainline Protestant men, and then men who had no affiliation here in America. And what I found in that book, and again, this speaks to the second question that I posed at the beginning of my comments tonight, what I found in this book is that church-going evangelical uh, men had wives who reported the highest levels of marital happiness, uh, followed then closely by wives who had church-going mainline Protestant men, um, and then wives whose husbands were not affiliated anyway were at a lower tier. Um, in this particular outcome. So, again, at least in terms of just overall happiness, this story is not what you might expect from some, um, you know, stories in the media. And then when it comes to domestic violence, uh, the subject of that ABC story down under, um, what we see is that, um, in, in the United States anyways, active conservative Protestant men or evangelical Protestant men have... Um, the lowest levels of domestic violence uh, here in the United States. And, um, you know, it's, it's interesting to think about that or to see that. And we do see also work from Christopher Ellison at the University of Texas um, that just across the board, couples who attend church more often are more, you know, likely to be, it seems to be steering clear of, of domestic violence. And what's also, I think, interesting to note, now that we're here at this particular slide, and I didn't say earlier about the ABC story, is that the ABC story was based on really only one piece of research when it came to sort of representative, um, you know, statistical analysis of, a day, and it was my study, actually. So they didn't actually even have any data on uh, Australian couples uh, from a kind of a national representative sample of Australia. And, you know, What's, of course, strange about their story is that it's the church-going evangelical men, you know, in my research, who are the ones least likely to either themselves or their wives, you know, be reporting some kind of, of abuse um, in their marriage. So, again, this doesn't actually really fit the whole narrative that ABC was rolling out um, in Australia about kind of the church aiding and, um, and abetting, if you will, uh, domestic violence. As we move on to some other outcomes, we see, again, a kind of story here about how um, religions link to less divorce. This is uh, Tyler Vanderbilt at Harvard um, showing that divorce is less common. In this case for women who are regularly attending um, church, but I've also found in other research for both women and men that uh, people who are regularly attending are about 35% less likely to get divorced um, than their peers who don't regularly attend religious services. Likewise, when it comes to how engaged uh, men are with their children, um, work by my colleague at UVA, Carl Bowman, indicates that more religious men are more likely to be spending at least their hours a day with their kids um, compared to um, their less religious and more secular peers. So again, there's a connection between sort of faith and fatherhood here that's uh, pretty noteworthy um, in the data, and also a connection between more engaged uh, moms um, and, and religious faith as well from Carl Bowman's uh, research on family life here, um, you know, in America. So at least kind of when you look at the, at the evidence here in the United States, um, the bottom line is that it looks like religion's a force uh, for good um, in terms of being linked to higher quality and more stable marriages um, and more engaged fathers and mothers here um, in the U.S., and when it comes to that second question that I posed at the beginning of our time together tonight, it's clearly the case that religious men, including evangelical men, are living more family-centered lives and are more likely also to have wives who report higher quality 
uh, marriages. So not exactly what Steve and Cookie Roberts might have suspected, um, you know, given their comments about, uh, about Southern Baptists. Okay, so I've, I've made the case that there are these sort of links or associations, connections between faith and family life um, in America. And I think the obvious question confronting us now is why? What's, uh, what's going on here? And I would say, t- to kind of begin to think about this, uh, from a Durkheimian perspective, and Emile Durkheim is a, a famous French sociologist from the 19th century, who kind of had this idea that um, religious tradition really didn't matter from his perspective. Um, What mattered more is just sort of being involved or integrated into some kind of religious community. And from his, you know, again, Durkheimian perspective, these are the kinds of things that he thinks would explain the connection between um, religion and the kinds of family outcomes that we have just reviewed. So religion provides uh, rituals and discourse that endow family life with a kind of supernatural or a sacred character. You think about a wedding ritual or a baptismal ritual that, um, especially, you know, I'm, I'm Catholic, so for a baptism in our tradition would be, you know, kind of also connected to, to the way in which fathers and mothers are thinking about, uh, about their children. You can think about f- sort of how religious institutions tend to promote um, a lot of family-centered activities that allow parents to spend time with one another and with their children. A father-daughter dance might, you know, be a tradition, you know, in your local congregation, for instance, one example um, of that. A third point would be sort of the way in which social networks um, operate. We do know that here in the United States, um, religious networks tend to have more people who are married with kids in those networks. And they offer both support and social control to the members of those networks. Um, And I think kind of one way to think about that is to kind of give you a negative example. And I think actually probably in this, this, this person may even be a Baptist, you know, no offense. But um, and the, the negative example here is, is Mark Sanford, who was a Republican governor of South Carolina. He was kind of, you know, very popular and seemed to be kind of, you know, an upward profile. And yet there, there came a day when a reporter was kind of trying to track him down and someone on his staff said that Governor Sanford was hiking the Appalachian Trail. And, and then it came out so, you know, somehow that in fact he was actually you know, exiting the Atlanta airport uh, when he was supposed to be hiking the Appalachian Trail. Um, and then it came out that he had been down in Latin America. Um, and then it came out that he'd been with some of his male buddies. And then it came out that he had um, had an affair with, uh, I think it was an Argentinian woman um, on a ranch uh, down there in Latin America. And his buddies apparently had no problem with all of this. The, the point I'm making here is that his, his male friends were really not there uh, for his marriage. Uh, they weren't really there for his, his wife. And probably they weren't you know, particularly um, sort of concerned perhaps with kind of you know, faith-based um, or part of a faith community. Um, by contrast, People who are engaged in some kind of religious congregation and community are more likely to kind of reinforce um, the norm of fidelity. And we do see that couples who are attending together um, are more likely to have friends, um, shared friends, and that that in turn is linked to more fidelity in American marriages. So that's sort of an example of how uh, religious communities can actually um, help to strengthen and support marriages. And the final point here along the lines of sort of thinking about religion as a more generic force uh, for families is the way in which it extends a sacred canopy, uh, what sociologist Peter Berger called a sacred canopy, where people have the sense that there's something you know, standing above them and over them and, and beyond them. There's some kind of supernatural force that's sort of guiding their lives, giving them a sense of meaning, hope, and purpose. And this can be particularly important when it comes to sort of negotiating or dealing with stress. If you think about sort of the impact that stress has had on your own life and how it affects your relationship with perhaps your spouse, your kids, your friends, your colleagues, you probably recognize that stress can be a pretty corrosive force in our lives and in our families. So what faith can do for, you know, for many people is allow them to deal with things like the loss of a job, uh, the loss of a loved one, um, a, a difficult teenager, um, or a debilitating disease. Um, in, in more constructive ways. Again, it can, can buffer against 
the corrosive effects of stress um, on, on their marriage and on their families more generally. So these are some of, again, the rituals, the family time, the social networks, and the sacred canopy, they're all associated with religious traditions um, across the board pretty much in the US, I think can have effects that tend to reinforce stronger, um, stronger marriages and stronger uh, family relationships. And on this point, I just want to make a particular point about prayer. So in my work with Nicholas Wolfinger, we looked at uh, sort of the power of social networks on this figure right here. And we found that people had more friends um, in their religious networks tended to be happier here in yellow for those who had less, uh, had fewer friends in their religious network. But we found that praying together as a couple um, this is outside of grace at meals, was um, the best religious predictor of a high quality marriage in our data. So it was a better predictor than was church attendance. It was a better predictor than having a shared religious social network. Um, and you know, it was also just in general a very good predictor compared to other things in our statistical models of more happiness um, in marriage. So, um, this again is kind of one way in which we can sort of see how a religious ritual um, through a kind of a Durkheimian prism seems to be associated with higher quality uh, marriages here in the United States. So again, I've just talked to you about thinking about sort of religion and family through the perspective of Emile Durkheim, a French sociologist who again wouldn't distinguish between Catholics and Protestants and Jews in some important ways um, on this kind of subject. But I want to now turn to this next slide, and I want to suggest to you that, you know, a different European sociologist from the same century, Max Weber, um, had this idea that different traditions were associated with different ways of life. And so from Weber's perspective, he'd be more interested in thinking about, well, how does, say, a family in an evangelical tradition look different than a family in a Catholic or in a Jewish um, or in, in a sort of a secular tradition. So again, he'd be focusing more on the differences across traditions. Um, and so from a kind of a more Weberian perspective, um, what I'd want to suggest from my research on religion, family life in America is that there are some things about evangelicals that, are, um, that I think are distinctive and account for the fact um, that I think evangelical men are more likely to sort of link their faith to their family life and to have somewhat higher quality marriages than many other um, couples um, in different religious traditions in the United States. And so I would focus, again, on four different things, in this case, for evangelicals. The first thing that I would say is that I think they tend to have, at least compared to Catholics and mainline Protestants and, and conservative Reformed Jews, a stronger sense that kind of religion is guiding their approach to family life. And so when it comes to say for you know, their kids' well-being, they're thinking not just about Harvard, but also about heaven. Um, and they're more concerned about getting their kid into heaven than they are getting their kid in, into Harvard. Um, and that has implications for sort of how intentional they are um, in raising their kids. Um, and then also I think too, in terms of thinking about the importance of embodying God's mercy and his justice um, to their children. A second thing that I've seen in my research is that when it comes to sort of measuring what I call familism, and that is kind of this idea that the family is a fundamental institution that uh, we also need to kind of um, defer to certain norms about the importance of marital permanence um, and the importance of marriage more generally, um, that evangelicals tend to be more familistic uh, than Catholics, mainline Protestants, um, and Reform and conservative Jews as well. And so this, this familism that we see um, in evangelical you know, communities and also, frankly, in, in, in Mormon communities tends to orient men to the welfare of their, um, of their families, you know, the welfare of their wife and, and children um, because they have this kind of family-centered way of thinking um, you know, that they hear about from the pulpit or uh, in a Bible study or some other kind of venue. The third thing that I think we see is there's often a pastoral focus uh, either from the pulpit or from some kind of other ministry on men's family responsibilities where kind of men are specifically being called out to do X or Y or Z. 
and because they're being called out to do these things in their families, they're more likely to do them. Um, and so I think what we see is that evangelical congregations, as compared again to Catholic and Mammon Protestant and Reform and conservative Jewish congregations, I think are more likely to specifically underline the importance of men taking an active and engaged role in their families in ways that encourage um, men to, uh, to step up, so to speak. And the final point I'd make here is there's a kind of a fraternal ethos you see in many evangelical churches, not, of course not all, where um, the leadership of the church um, and a men's group in the church kind of provide a healthy venue for the expression of masculinity um, that I think tends to um, encourage and inspire men you know, to, um, to uh, connect their identity as men to their identity as, as husbands and fathers. So one example I, on this score is that I was t talking to a, a, a black Baptist, actually, pastor in, in Seattle, and he was making the point that he was, um, you know, having his men's um, group come uh, to watch Monday Night Football. And then during the break, um, they'd have a sort of a message um, that was targeted towards them um, and often sort of touching on some kind of family-related themes. So this is kind of an example of the way in which, you know, he was... Um, encouraging his men in a specifically sort of male-friendly way, but in ways that I think redound to the benefit of um, his congregants' um, uh, families. Now, kind of putting all this together, I think, again, particularly for men, I think what we're seeing here is, um, and I'm borrowing here from sociologist John Barkowski, who's also at the University of Texas, who's kind of written on these, on these themes. What I think we're sort of seeing here is that Paradoxically, in some ways, evangelical Protestant men are more likely to be domesticated as to have their, sort of their hearts and minds turned towards the family um, because they're being encouraged to do this by um, strong masculine leaders and uh, fellow congregants in their own religious communities. So again, the paradox here is that these men are in some ways doing a kind of a, what would often be seen as a more feminine thing because they're being encouraged to do so by, uh, by men in their, um, in, in their local churches. But as we think about kind of the why here, again, in more general terms, what I'm suggesting to you tonight is that kind of the norms, the teachings, the social support and the rituals associated with religion in America help to explain why religious families tend to be happier um, and more stable. So I've given you a message tonight that suggests that in the main, religion is a force for good um, in American families. But I want to give you some caveats tonight. I don't want to kind of just paint a rose-colored picture of this religion family uh, nexus, because that's, you know, of course, not the whole story. There's always, you know, more nuance to any story like this. And so a couple of points here. The first point that I'd make is that um, the positive effects of religion often do not extend to couples and families who don't share a common religious identity, okay? And so we see, for instance, the work of Chris Allison at the University of Texas that theologically conservative men who are married to more progressive secular women have the highest rates of domestic violence, for instance. That would be kind of one example of how this is sort of playing out in practice. And this kind of point is, is obviously especially important today, where more than 50% of Americans are marrying outside of their own religious tradition growing up. Okay, so there are, there are a lot of couples and a lot of families who are not on the same page religiously today. And, you know, these couples and these families um, are more vulnerable um, on a number of different fronts. A second important caveat uh, to all of this is that nominal Christians um, are the worst on many family outcomes. And when I say nominal, what I'm talking about are, are people who attend church, you know, maybe three or four times a year, or just Christmas and Easter, or, or never. But if they were called up on, you know, on a survey, um, would say, yeah, I'm a, I'm a Baptist or I'm a Christian. Um, and in my own research, and this actually was picked up by ABC News down in Australia, um, I found that nominal evangelical Protestant men um, 
had the highest levels of violence in, in their marriages. Um, and we also see they have the highest levels of divorce as well. And a lot of these folks are actually nominal Baptists. Um, so what's going on here? Well, I think there are different ways of thinking about what's happening here. And I think all of these three different theories are, are plausible, or they all may be working, actually, sort of, you know, to explain this pattern. One idea is that sort of notions of, of sort of patriarchy and male authority you do find articulated in the Bible. Um, maybe a kind of a hitting license uh, for guys, or the li license for kind of abusive and authoritarian behavior for guys who are not integrated into a church community. They kind of think of themselves, well, I'm the head of this family, and da 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 you know, and that then again, you know, makes them um, more likely to engage in, in um, abusive or authoritarian behavior in their families. That's one, I think, possibility here. A second possibility here is there's a kind of a class story that a lot of these, you know, folks are working class or poor Americans. They're just, they're, they're dealing with a lot of economic stress in their lives. Um, they're living in social networks where there's just more family dysfunction. And this class story may account for why it is that nominal um, conservative Protestants or nominal evangelical Protestants um, do so poorly on a lot of family outcomes. And then a third possibility is um, a cultural story. And that is if you look at kind of where geographically a lot of this is playing out, it's playing out in Appalachia and the Bible bucket of the South, okay? Um, sorry, the, the Bible belt in the South, okay? Um, getting my, my words mangled here a little bit. And so what we know about this sort of part of the world, and this is actually sort of in this part of the world right here, but is that this, these are regions where Scotch-Irish folk immigrated, you know, many, many years ago and, and settled. And um, I don't mean to, you know, be offensive or politically incorrect. Um, and and Scotch-Irish, actually, folks are known for, among other things, being um, really important um, contributors to our armed services in, here in this country. Um, and you may know that Senator Jim Webb, who is himself Scotch-Irish, wrote a book called Born Fighting about Scotch-Irish. And, of course, there are many things about that that are just perfectly wonderful and important for our country and, and for their communities. But having a kind of fighting spirit doesn't always go over very well in a marriage and in a family, right? And so what may be happening here, too, is that um, the legacy of the honor culture in certain parts of Scotland and Ireland, um, which are associated with kind of a more com combative ethos, may extend into, into marriage um, and may be linked to, um, you know, s certain behaviors that are not conducive to strong and stable families. And again, we're, you know, we're Americans. We tend to think about the present. We tend not to sort of grant this idea that, you know, a, a legacy from a culture and a place that's very far from us, both in time and space, may affect us today. But what's striking is that there is, at least on, when it comes to um, patterns of violence, very clear regional differences in America. And again, regions where the Scotch-Irish settled, even to this day, are much more violent than other parts of this country. So I think there's something perhaps, again, also to this, uh, to this cultural story and helping to explain why it is that nominal Christians um, are um, the worst off on many family outcomes. So the bottom line here in terms of the caveats is that in some cases, and there are some conditions, and I've just named you know, really two, but of course we can think about others, religion's not linked to better family outcomes in America. I think you know, it's also the case too, I'm not, when it comes back to that, that ABC story that I mentioned from Australia at the beginning, I'm not in any way denying kind of the sort of force and power of individual cases of abuse and malfeasance on the part of, of pastors and priests and Christian councils which were, which were uh, articulated and enunciated in that ABC story. I'm sure also you could do the same story here in America. There's no doubt about that. So we also think you have to be thinking about you know, that reality and in sort of encouraging our pastors and our priests and our lay leaders um, to do more to reach out to families who are hurting um, and also to root out uh, things like domestic violence that are still part and parcel of uh, religious families as well here uh, in the United States. 
So let me conclude um, by, by saying this. I think that over the next decade, my prediction is that in this changing cultural context, not to mention the poisonous political climate now um, in our country, we're going to be exposed you know, more and more to this new conventional wisdom, this wisdom which would suggest that you know, religion is a uh, baleful force for women, uh, for children, um, and for families. But we, I think, need to be skeptical about this, this new line um, because what we see actually in the data is that on average, you know, for sort of the, the typical family who is engaged in a life of religious community, um, they're more likely to be experiencing higher quality marriages, to have lower divorce rates, and also to enjoy more involved mothers and fathers. So the point here is that in general and on average, faith is not a force for ill, it's really a force uh, for good. And then the final point here then is too, when it comes to this issue of, of gender, which I, I think it does invite a lot of suspicion or a study on the part of some scholars and some folks in, um, in the pop culture and in journalism, what we see in Kind of in reality and on the ground is that religion is not turning men into abusive or authoritarian patriarchs, but rather that religion is, you know, on average, um, encouraging men to turn their hearts um, and their minds and uh, their hands in, in good ways um, toward um, towards their families. Uh, and that, my friends, is good news in a nation where the fortunes of the family too often seem um, to be flagging. So thank you very much for joining me tonight.